Over the last few weeks, I've been doing a number of videos in a video series about my ultimate office makeover. And this is the final video in the series where I walk through all the lessons learned, tips and tricks that I learned throughout the process, and things that maybe you can avoid if you choose to renovate your office or do some sort of makeover in any part of your house. So if you like this type of content, stick around and let's go ahead and get on with the video. Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. So today is part six of the Ultimate Office Makeover video series, and it is the final segment of the video series. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through the lessons learned, or at least the things that I observed while doing the makeover and things that maybe hopefully you can avoid. So I think it's gonna be exciting and it's gonna offer a lot of value. So if you like this type of content, please consider subscribing, ringing that bell, very important these days. Let's go ahead and get on with the first lesson learned. My first lesson learned is around the material that I use to create all of the furniture here in the office, and that is MDF. MDF stands for medium density fiber board, and it is just that. It is wood fibers stuck together with glue and pressed into a sheet. Because MDF is a combination of glue and wood, it is significantly heavier than regular plywood or even regular hardwood. So please keep that in mind when you're building your project. If you choose MDF for your project, I highly recommend you pre-drill all your holes. MDF has a tendency to split or strip when you're screwing into it. And so pre-drilling really helps you avoid that and I highly recommend it. Because MDF is a wood fiber product, it doesn't actually cut like normal wood. It doesn't produce sawdust per se. It produces a very fine wood dust. And because of that, I recommend you have excellent dust collection and you wear a respirator at all times. You definitely don't want those fine wood products ending up in your lungs. Before you paint your MDF project, I highly recommend you sand the material first. I chose to prime my material and I did not sand in advance. And because of this, a lot of the primer material ended up peeling or flaking off whenever I was assembling. And so the pieces that I sanded in advance, the paint stuck just fine. So highly recommend you sand the MDF before you paint it. The last thing I'd like to mention about MDF is really an artifact of it being a fiberboard rather than a hardwood or a plywood. And that is that it is easy to carve. So if you do need to make small adjustments of the MDF while you're doing the assembly, it's much easier to adjust the size or carve a little notch out uh, than it is with something like hardwood or certainly plywood. Lesson learned number two is to label all of your parts. So in this case, I had 53 individual parts that I had to cut out of 10 sheets of MDF. Had I not labeled the parts in advance and while I was cutting them, I really have no hope of assembling in the proper order and making sure that I had all of the parts whenever I went into final assembly. So I highly recommend you label all the parts while you're cutting them and then it'll make assembly so much easier in the end. Lesson learned number three is to measure everything twice, especially before you do the final assembly. And what I mean by that is the rooms and the walls are not square, they are not plumb, they are not straight. So if you do simple measurements for your CAD diagram, like I did, you need to validate those measurements before you go to assembly. I had a lot of issues with the horizontal storage unit up here, the side storage unit here, and the closet, because I just assumed the walls were perfectly parallel and perfectly straight. And as it turns out, they're not. So I actually had to take the horizontal unit down twice and chop a little bit off. And what I mean a little bit, I ended up chopping off about two full inches off of the length of the horizontal unit because the vertical unit here doesn't go all the way into the corner. It doesn't go all the way into the corner because the walls are not completely straight. So the bottom and the top don't slide in as far as I thought they would. 
So lesson learned, measure twice, cut once. Lesson learned number four is all about the LEDs that I have in the office makeover. So when I sent out to do this project, I certainly wanted to have LEDs and I think they turned out very well. I think they look great. However, what I didn't do in advance is really think through exactly how I wanted to wire them. So when I went to go do the assembly, I actually ended up having to cut some holes into the desk that I wasn't anticipating to run the wires down from the top all the way down to the bottom. So a little bit of more planning, and I think maybe I would have been able to avoid having holes in the desktop or maybe be able to route the wires maybe behind the cabinets or around some places so they weren't nearly as visible. The second thing I would mention about the LEDs is if you have the opportunity, install them before you assemble your furniture. If you have not already watched part three of the video where I walk through the installation of the electronics and the LEDs, it was pretty much a fail, an epic fail, an unmitigated disaster. I thought that it would be really easy. The LEDs had a little bit of sticky on the back. I would stick the LEDs up there. I would do a little bit of soldering, attach the wires, no big deal. Well, the vertical cabinet, for example, is 24 inches deep and it is 92 inches tall. So crawling into a cavern, 92 inches off the ground, 24 inches deep, and trying to hold a little soldering iron on a little LED pad that is about an eighth of an inch wide was challenging. It was actually insurmountable. I was incapable of doing it. So what I would recommend doing is go ahead, put the LEDs in their tracks before you assemble anything. You don't necessarily have to wire them up completely, but once they're in there, they're glued into place, they're locked into place, you can assemble them, wire a little feeder wire in so that you have more to work with when you go to the final assembly. That would have made it a lot easier and that's definitely what I'm going to do if I do another project like this. The last thing I want to mention about the LEDs is really sit down and think about how much current your LEDs are going to pull. Now, I chose to use LED strips that have 30 LEDs per meter, and I ended up using roughly about 25 meters or so of LEDs, which ended up with a tremendous number of LEDs. And at 20 milliamps per color, three colors per LED, it draws a lot of current. I had to buy a 350 watt, five volt, 60 amp power supply to power all of the LEDs. And so I just didn't think through that in advance. I just thought a regular old power supply would work and it just didn't. The second artifact of this is, is you need to feed power to the LEDs at multiple locations throughout the strip. I ended up feeding essentially from each end where I could, and if I had to, I fed from the middle. So for the vertical storage, the left and the right side are both getting power, and for the horizontal storage, um, both sides, left and right, are getting power as well. And that actually allowed me to create uh, a good current flow, a good voltage across all of the LEDs, and, and have good color rendering on the LEDs because they got enough current. So, all right, well, this is number five the fifth area that I want to cover to close out this video series, and that is the cost of my office renovation. I'll be honest with you, after I totaled it up, I was actually kind of shocked. So, you know, the cost was actually spread out across a, a large number of months. Uh, you know, I bought all the materials for the for the cabinets and for the shelves and, and whatnot oh, one month. Uh, I assembled them. I did all the leg work uh, probably the next month, you know, painting them and, and sanding them and, and whatnot, and then final assembly the next month. So, you know, the build was actually spread out over a, a fair amount of time. My original intention was to do this all in one weekend, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of looking back foolish at best. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it could have been two or three weekends in a row if I had jammed it all together and had all the materials, but it wasn't. So, 
So over here, I have the detailed list of everything that I purchased for this office renovation. And I broke it down into three big broad categories, material, consumables, and items that are reusable, but that I had to buy for this project. By that metric, the uh, reusable things are not necessarily completely contributing to the cost of the office renovation, but they still would not be in my possession if I had not done the office renovation. So I count them in cost towards that. So, okay, so let me give you the bottom line. <laughs> in total total cost of things that I was able to add up and purchase, ignoring kind of odds and ends, and that cost was $1,394.41. So uh, $1,400 US. I was actually significantly shocked and taken back by that number. Uh, I knew that the project was going to be expensive when I set out to do it uh, because I did originally intend to do everything in uh, Baltic Birch and I knew that cost was not going to be insignificant and we'll talk about that in just a bit. I ended up using MDF to save money and still it was uh, you know $1,400 and in my mind I originally had set a budget around $500. So I pretty much blew my mental budget by uh, three times, which is interesting and unfortunate, but I'd like to kind of walk you through why, why that happened and, and what the contributors are. So let me go ahead and kind of break down the costs a little bit more granular and kind of talk about what the drivers were and maybe things you might want to consider if you were to do this. Okay, so breaking down the cost into the three big broad buckets of material, consumable, and reusable items, the material cost was $1,003.89, which was a little surprising to me. I thought it would be lower, and that represents roughly 72% uh, of the overall cost of the project. So those are the things that you really can't avoid and the things that you can't reuse and the things that are not necessarily consumable in nature. Moving on to what I consider the consumable things, uh, that was $219.44. And so by that, uh, like the pins for the shelves are consumable because you, you can reuse them, but they're kind of there for the duration of the shelf. So I wouldn't consider them readily reusable. Screws, nails, things like that are considered consumable, things you're never going to get back. Okay, the next category is the reusable category. That was uh, $171.08. That made up things like the shelving jig, some of, I, I bought a countersink bit, uh, an Amana countersink bit, which I love. I will link to it below. It's fantastic. Uh, but it's reusable. I would not have bought it except for this project because I knew I wanted to countersink the holes. And then the last thing there in terms of uh, reusable was the pin nailer. I bought the Brad nailer for this specific project. It was on my kind of short list of things I wanted to buy anyway. It really wasn't that expensive, but it did add to the cost of the project. Let's see, the Brad nailer was $79. So I guess that is almost, let's see, about 40% of the cost of the, of the reusable items. All right, well, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing, ringing that bell, very important these days. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so, because that's where I post pictures of projects like this to become future videos. Again, thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to be inspired. Next. The next thing I'd like to, what do I want to say? And so if you do a simple measurement for your CAD dot, <clears throat> so if you do simple measurements for your CAD diagram, like I did around some places, so they weren't nearly as visible. Oh, okay. Well, right off the bat, the material cost. The cost of the material that I couldn't avoid was $1,003.89. So, you know, what is that? What the hell is that? Third of the cost? No, it's not a third of the cost. What the hell is that? Uh, 70. <clears throat>